Welcome to Tower Talk Business Radio, where we bring you conversations with the top business minds on Long Island and around the nation every week. Featuring expert consultants and small business owners who have found success, but are also willing to share their top tips, failures, and give gritty, matter-of-fact advice based on their firsthand experience. Now, let's Let's get get down down to business business on on Tower Talk Talk Business Business Radio Radio, on on the the voice of Nassau Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello and welcome to Tower Talk Business Radio, powered by the Nassau Community College Foundation. My name is Ray Schwetz, AVP of Business Banking at Jovia Financial Credit Union. We're focused on being the premier resource for business and entrepreneurship. We bring you weekly business advice, tips, tools, and services that help you grow your business. Plus, we interview top business leaders in the industry. And I'm very excited. Helping provide us with empowerment today is a passionate leader in the nonprofit field and somebody who's an expert in play, Erica Floresca. She's the Director of Development at the Long Island Children's Museum. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thanks, Ray. It's great to be here. (laughs) Well, we're glad to have you. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am a mom of two teenagers. I'm a flute player by training, but I've spent 25 years in the nonprofit industry, leading um, education programs in music, in theater, and now here at the Long Island Children's Museum, which is play all day. (laughs) <laughs> I, I love it. You know, I, I remember my, my oldest is 21 now. Uh, we would bring her there so many times. And uh, I have so many great memories and great photos. Um, I mean, it is just, those things are just irreplaceable. The, the bubble room. Yep. Oh, the bubbles. Everybody bubble loves the bubbles. bubble room is my favorite. Um, my daughter loved the rope climbing, yep. uh, the maze. Yep. Uh-huh. Yep, that's the climbers a favorite. I actually took my kids there. That's how I first got to know the museum. Um, mm-hmm. I live in Baldwin, so I've been here for over 20 years on Long Island. Mm-hmm. And every time my parents came to visit, we'd go to the Long Island Children's Museum. And some of the photos I have of my kids with my parents, they live in Minnesota, you know, uh-huh. at the block table, doing the bubbles, you know, climber. My daughter's favorite was the climber, always. Yes. And so now to be there as a employee and seeing it continues to inspire and engage families just like I was, you know, we had my son's birthday party, this is sixth birthday party there. And um, we found the records of it recently this last week. And I'm like, I love this place, both as a parent and, you know, now as a passionate advocate for it. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I, those memories, it's just, they're amazing. And you, you have such wonderful programs there. Um, now, how did you make the transition of being a parent, bringing your child there to now you're involved uh, with Long Island Children's Museum doing the job and doing the work that you do. Sure. Well, I had most of my career was in New York, was in the city, and I was doing the commute, good old Long Island Railroad. I drive a number of times. And as my kids got older, I actually found I wanted to be closer to them and in sure. the high school years and was really looking for a place in Long Island where my commute would be better, but where I would still have the same values that I really care about of education, bringing the community together. And um, I met Suzanne LeBlanc, our president, um, at a meeting and started talking with her. And about six months later, the the director of development had left. And I said, ooh, I am very interested. And that's what turned into um, being able to come here not knowing when I accepted the job in January of 2020 that my <laughs> first day would be the week after the museum closed due to COVID. So it's been an adventure. <laughs> Timing's everything. Now, your work before uh, Long Island Children's Museum, so you, um, I know you were involved in some theater work. Tell us a little bit about like, what your work was before the Children's Museum. Sure. Um, before here, I was an executive director, for, uh, most recently at a community music school, but then also two years at Tectonic Theater Project, which was a theater development company. Um, and we would develop works that then we would tour across the country and di- to different theaters um, and produce with different theaters. And one of the things that made LICM the place for me is that we have a theater and a theater it was built with a theater 140 seats it's like as good as an off-broadway theater and to have the performing arts central to also the the exhibits and all the experiential learning um, really you know was kind of a match made in heaven for me so I could stay in the performing arts which really teach kids about empathy and relating to others and expressing yourself in ways different than um, some of the stem programs we have which is real hands-on learning how to build bridges how to plant a seed and grow flowers and um, how to play, just have fun playing. Um, And so to have the theater central to also the museum and the exhibits and all the community programs was um, really important to me. And I've been able to draw on that experience from my theater days and my music days every day at the museum. 
Yeah, there's really so much there. It, you know, I mean, it took me, I don't know how many visits to really explore every nook and cranny of the museum just to see. Uh, and the museum, it's funny, uh, the first year that I was there, I must have walked past it a hundred times and not even realized really what it was. I'm, I'm unfortunately not surprised to hear that. There are a number of people who still don't know that Long Island has a children's museum. And um, we've been on Museum Row for 20 years, just celebrated that. Um, we've even, we our community programs are amazing, really developed. Um, they're sort of under the radar from mm-hmm. the exhibits that everyone sees. And those are really uh, amazing work. They've been recognized with the National Medal of Honor, which is the highest honor you can get oh, wow. um, for a museum. We had the My president had to go to the White House to get that in 2012. Um, and most recently, we just got accredited, accredited. So we have an accreditation from the Association of American Museums. I think that's the name, mm. um, which is means that we've been sort of dubbed the gold standard of museums. There are only 16 children's museums in the whole country that have this accreditation. Um, and we got wow. it during COVID, which just gives everyone a confidence that the exhibits you're going to, the way we work, the the way we deliver our programs is, you know, is a top excellence and for the community. And yet people still don't know we're here. So... <laughs> I'm so happy to be here to <laughs> let the world know there's this awesome museum with 15 exhibits. And um, I think what you just said is the beauty of it is you don't you can just go every time and discover something new. And for kids at different ages and stages of development, different exhibits speak to them at different times. So it's kind of a place you go once and have the bubbles and tot spot and your favorite things. And the next time you come in on the second floor, there's the newsroom. You can talk in a radio. We have a radio room. Um, you can build blocks, feasts for beasts and really explore. You know, we have live animals. We have a bearded dragon and a snake and all kinds of ways to discover anything about the world through play and interactive experiences. Um, it really, it's a really special place and we hope everyone will come. That was my experience as my oldest started to grow and we added to the family. So, you know, we brought my middle child mm-hmm. and my my older child uh, at the time. They went in two different directions and yep. it was fine <laughs> because, you know, the place is, it's a big place, but it's a safe place and it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's easy to kind of keep tabs on everybody. Um, even if one's doing the rope climbing and yep, the other one's yep. upstairs in the, in the TV studio yep, uh, yep. doing their thing. And we have our educators always keeping an eye out, you know, for lost children or children who get separated from their adults. It's, yep. um, you know, it happens, but it's, it's, they don't get lost. It's just, there's so many places to explore. And um, I can see you now with kids going in two different directions and who's going which way and um, follow no, their passion and their interest. And I, I, ne- I never worried about it. It was always something that, you know, I knew I just, told them yes i'll be by the bubble place or you know but you know and they would know yep all right i'll come back there um and there was plenty of spots for the parents to sit and you could kind of eyeball in three different directions so i love that too (laughs) so now what is your your what is your day-to-day like at the museum um do you get to play all day i'm assuming you, you you unfortunately you don't but. Well, for me, I mean, my job is is I, a little bit of adult play. I mean, I really, um, in the fundraising realm, you're about making relationships and meeting people and making connections between the interests of a person, what mu- what the museum has to offer, and how they can support that through contributed revenue. Um, half the museum's revenue comes from those ticket sales and school groups. We call that earned revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, the other half comes from support from um, government uh, grants, from foundation grants, individuals and a big gala that we have every year. And so my job day to day is being on the phone, reaching out to people, really telling the story of different programs or exhibits or initiatives we have to our community and asking for support where those values align. And so for me, the content of what the museum is, that is play, that is experience, that is exploring, that is um, igniting our kids' imagination, being able to talk about that and and present that in a way um, that connects with people, that's it. I mean, I sit at my desk, I make phone calls, I write a lot of emails, <laughs> to be true, but every once in a while, I'll get up from my desk and just walk out into the museum where there are kids screaming and playing and discovering. Anytime I need a little boost or a reminder that's of, a heck of a reach of what our mission is, um, it's awesome. I mean, it's right there. I can actually hear it in my office sometimes when we get big groups going, so... You are listening to Tower Talk Business Radio on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. 
I'm Ray Schwetz, and our guest today is Erica Floresca. She's the Director of Development at the Long Island Children's Museum. Now, you touched upon the exhibits. Let's talk about some of those exhibits because, um, obviously, there's a lot of mainstays to the museum. Mm -hmm. And, again, it takes you a long time to discover all that. Um, But in addition to those mainstays, you have some uh, exhibits that change over time. Can you give us some examples of some of those exhibits? Sure. We have um, what's called Comings and Goings. It's a gallery where we present different traveling exhibits. And also Kaleidozone is um, sort of our area for visual arts. And we really, we, we, turn these out about three different times a year. So right now, um, over the summer, we're really excited about an exhibit um, that features the artwork of four Shinnecock artists. The theme is bridges. And each artist, one is a painter, one is a photographer, one does um, applique and and, uh, fabric work, and the other does also painting and jewelry making. And we've had each of the artists in the museum, and we focus on their artwork for two weeks at a time. They've done workshops with our families. Um, Anyone who comes can do activities in the gallery that relate to that art and really learn about the Shinnecock Nation history, their current contemporary um, settings, and how art is a way to express yourself. And um, their art is also on exhibit. It's really an extraordinary exhibit. Um, Coming up next, we're excited in the winter, uh, late fall winter, to bring back sock skating. This was a popular Mm. exhibit um, we brought back right as the pandemic was ending. Kids really needed a chance to work their physical muscles, like the climber had been closed for so long, which is a standard at the museum. We brought in sock skating last summer, where it literally is what it sounds like. It's a polyurethane floor where you wear your (laughs) socks and you skate around. It was really popular. So we're bringing that back this winter and creating a whole winter village around it. And in our theater, we're going to have a Christmas carol. So we're really establishing and hoping families look to LICM as one of their holiday traditions in coming to the museum. So that'll be in the winter. And then uh, next spring, or actually next February, maybe even January, um, we're really excited. We're going to have an exhibit all based on Mo Wellam's uh, literary works, uh, Pigeon Comes to LICM. And we're also, um, and that's all inspired by Mo Wellam's work. He's a great art author, very popular with young children. Um, and in our theater, we're going to feature two of his plays, Pigeon on a Bus and <laughs> Elephant and Piggy. That's what we're gearing up for right now. And that traveling exhibit area is where every time you come, you might see something different. We always try to have an interactive element to that. And um, really, it's kind of also where we can put, you know, we can showcase the art work of local artists we can bring children into the visual arts but in a way that is both doing how do you create art and how do you actually make it yourself because everyone's an artist inside you don't just have to look at it and not touch i I would agree entirely in fact i think that's one of the great successes of the museum is that it is a museum where yes there's lots to see and yes there's lots to do but it's very interactive and it it sparks your brain into into creating and uh, that was one of the other the things that we really love was that building room. Yes. We would build. We always came home with a, a souvenir of our visit, and it was always some Frankenstein yep. uh, toolbox. Toolbox, yep. yes. It was uh, like blocks all nailed together and stuff. And, you know. It blows my mind. You know, when we first reopened after COVID, all of the staff had to take hours on the floor because, of course, we had, to, you know, we had to let go of all of our part time staff because we were closed. Um, and then rebuilding has been a real challenge, but a success story for us. But I got to work on the floor like twice oh, a week. Wow. And Toolbox was always the most interesting place. It was loud, of course. But that's where kids can come and you get four pieces of wood and nail them together. And every single item was different. And kids would find ways to put them together and parents would help the kids. You'd also see a lot of um, interaction mm-hmm. with parents. I think that's another element of the museum is when adults and children are working together to figure out a problem or learning together. And in Toolbox, that would always happen. And you're like, four blocks of wood can make, you know, a thousand different things. And you never knew what was going to happen day to day. We had a a wooden duck that we made. I wish I still had it. I'm sure I have a picture of it somewhere. It's somewhere. I love it. I love um, it. There were so many different spaceships and, and things. Uh, I mean, every, you know, that was one of Anything the things. Anything the imagination can have can be made. Yeah. I always tried to do that towards the end of the visit, so I wasn't holding the- Carrying you know, it around the whole time. The whole yep. time. But, you know, it invariably, that's what I wound up doing, which was just fine. That's um, awesome. Now, you also talked a little bit about some of the events. Now, me as a, as a 50-year-old adult, I'm mm-hmm. hearing about- 
what you're going to do over the holidays with the sock skating. And I'm like, all right, well, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So are there things for adults as well? There are. I mean, during the regular museum hours, you have to have a child to come. It's Mm -hmm. a child's place. Um, Mm -hmm. And we we do look at, we do a few evening activities um, for adults. That's something that I'm actually interested in developing more from a fundraising standpoint. And you're not alone. We have a lot of adults now who came to the museum as kids or their kids have outgrown it and we've actually thought about and um, having like an evening event and so if that's something you're interested in maybe we'll make that happen yes. during the sock skating and ca- Christmas carol events that could be really fun yeah I could see a business networking event where you're wearing your socks okay Ray we're doing it and we're doing it you have yeah, fancy socks yep and I love the idea <laughs> Let, let's partner with John's crazy socks that people buy their socks I love this and okay go sock, sock skating I love the way you're thinking. I, let's let's get planning. I think we need to make that. That would happen. be fun, really fun. Yeah, and also the galas. Uh, I've been to events uh, at the Children's Museum, and usually I'm thinking to myself, "Oh, I wish my kids were here with me." Um, but you know, it's just great to be there. So, can you talk a bit about the gala and some other things? You going bet. On? You bet. Um, LICM has, I think, one of the kind of landmark events, gala events, because it's so unique. It's called Cupcakes and Cocktails, which. Just in the name, you get a sense. (laughs) They're already. It's fun on both (laughs) sides, but has a lot of play. And it takes place at the museum. So it's not a sit down dinner kind of chicken at the, you know, catering house. Mm -hmm. You are at the museum letting your inner child out. And we have a great band that'll play this year um, in September. 22nd, we're celebrating our theater and bringing the theater out of the theater into the museum. So the oh. whole museum will be decorated and themed around um, our, the, the the history of our theater. Um, we're honoring a great couple, the Marinos, who are young philanthropists and really committed to giving back to Long Island. Um, we're also honoring um, our one of our founders, Ronnie Cohen Lemley, with the Great Friend to Kids Award. She's the visionary behind having a theater at the museum. And when you come, there's Drinks, of course, cocktails, um, but also all of our exhibits are open. We have hands-on activities related to the night. Um, we've got, we're going to actually be previewing a new exhibit that's in development, Saltwater Stories. Maybe I can Ooh, tell you a little bit that about that. Good. Um, but the whole evening is all, um, we've got wonderful sponsors. There's a silent auction that'll be online as well. So if you can't come, a great evening of business leaders passionate fans of the museum um, and a wonderful adult event to celebrate the community initiatives we have the presence of you know we think of LICM as kind of a town hall for the community for families and investing in that really matters because we need a place to come together we need a place to bring all of our communities together and LICM has been doing that for 20 years and will continue to do that so cupcakes and cocktails is a really fun party not too stuffy um, and really let your inner child out. That's what we say. Um, so we'd love any supporters and friends, their sponsorships. You can place a journal ad. Um, oh, and this year we're actually, we have new seats in our theater. Thanks oh. to Lyreg and Niska. We got a grant to update our theater after 20 years. And each of those seats you can name. We're doing for a thousand dollar donation. And until they're gone, we've got 140 seats. So um, that's kind of a really cool initiative related to the theater that will be starting kicking off that night. How cool is that? Wow. Now, you saltwater stories, so you have me intrigued there. I'm, I'm a big, you know, obviously we live on Long Island, so I love the beach. Uh, I love Shark Week. So tell us a little oh, bit yeah. about this. Well, this is a, the first new exhibit for the museum that's in development. It's been in development for two years, but inspired wow. by um, weekends that we had programmed called Saltwater Stories that bring together um, folks from the fishing industry and the maritime industry. Um and learn about and do activities from fish dissections to how to make a net to how to, you know, hook a line. And it was those weekends were so popular. The idea of doing an, a full exhibit about something that is so unique to our community. And it's the whole maritime culture. And we're developing, there'll be a bay house that'll be featured. There's going to be a oh, fish, wow. a fish market, a lighthouse and all interactive um, and informed by a incredible panel of advisors. We're really, we've been working for two years um, with folks from each of those industries, local, you know, fishermen, local um, fish uh, market folks, and um, and a whole bunch on the ecology and the climate change and how that's affecting um, our sea and our ocean. And for Long Island, that's yeah. so important to everything. And um, it'll be an interactive exhibit that 
promotes learning about all of these areas through fun and play, as always, um, and also helps make us all aware. You know, there are some folks who may not know how close we are to the ocean because they don't go to the beach all the time. Um, there are folks that may not know the history of fishing. And, you know, we've been working with the Shinnecock Nation and they have a whole you know history of whaling that is part of Long Island's um, uh, lore and, and truth. And so bringing all of that together into this new exhibit um, has been wonderful. And for me, I'm new to the museum world and understanding that it's going to be four to five years in development. I mean, this is how much research and thought and um, over the summer, the last couple of years, we've been prototyping different activities. We really work with our families in the museum now to help inform what will those interactive elements be. So we're really excited at Cupcakes and Cocktails. We'll be sharing the first, um, the prototype of it wow. in the studio that it, or in the exhibit room that it'll be in. And um, you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the coming years because we'll be going to fabrication and then opening, uh, we hope, in uh, 2024 sometime. You are listening to Tower Talk Business Radio. Our guest today is Erica Floresca, Director of Development at the Long Island Children's Museum. My name is Ray Schwetz on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. It's funny talking about the saltwater stories that reminds me of the room on the right when you first walk in, the what was that called? Uh, I call the it the construction room. The tot oh, spot. Tot Thank spot. You. The bus. Yes. <laughs> yes. I remember the gate. We got our ticket for the yep. specific time to go in. And my daughter putting on the raincoat and doing the fish market. There you go. Yep. There. So quite an experience. Oh, I love that, that memory. That's oh, so great. Yep. So many memories. So many memories. Yeah. Tot spot is an absolute favorite. It's for, it's, that's the one that's really designed for kids for and under the mm-hmm. early childhood. And, you know, there's a Long Island Railroad train in there there's mailbox the ice cream stand and the fish market and you know where we just see our littlest visitors have a chance to explore and crawl and play um that's it is definitely a favorite for for that age group yep and it's like disney world you know when you walk in you have to get your fast pass to that event because it's so worth it yeah yeah it's so (laughs) fun it Mm -hmm. It does it does covid made it a real challenge of sort of keeping the numbers at a level that are you know we can have all our social safe distancing um so we actually don't have t- time tickets now it's more oh, okay. um come come as you are but there's often a line and we rotate families in and out but it's it's uh you, you have to stop there if you're that age child <laughs> absolutely and that's uh, that's the other thing though it you, whenever you go there the experience is always so well managed mm. I, I have to say every time yeah. i looked around it wasn't just the child and the, the parent and everyone playing and, you know, the chaos that ensues with that. But yep. it's a controlled chaos. Yeah. There's always someone around. There's always a museum uh, personnel, an employee there uh, to ask a question. And everyone's always so friendly. You would think with so many families <laughs> and so much going on that, you know, people, but you hire the right people because those people are always happy. Well, you know, it's an aspect of the museum. I'm so glad that you say that. I mean, we're a people business and and the staff we hire, we have we have a lot of work study students. We're often the first job for folks coming out of or during college. Um, we also have some volunteers who may be retired. So we have a very diverse age-wise, people-wise workforce, but everyone is there to help families and children play and learn and grow. And it really, it does work in that way and everyone's committed to it. And sure, there's there's the chaos and there's the usual, you know, <laughs> mm. challenges here and there, but um, it is so well-structured and um, there's, you know, floor supervisors and floor educators and everybody who comes together to help provide that feeling of security and safety. And I like that, controlled chaos. <laughs> it, it is. That's exactly <laughs> that's a good, what That's a good is. phrase. And it's it's just so much fun. Now, and you, you talked about COVID. Uh, obviously, there were challenges uh, for the museum with COVID. And how did you kind of work through that? Yeah, I mean, it was extraordinary. I think every nonprofit was deep. I mean, the whole country, but I mean, all of it, the whole world, yes. actually. Um, for nonprofits, particularly that really run on a very thin <laughs> margin, um, extra challenging when you have to close your doors for six months. Uh, so we we managed, and and it was incredible the support of our families and members and donors and friends. Um, we did a lot of online learning and online programming during that time, and then as soon as we could, we reopened um, right after Labor Day of 2020. Mm-hmm. As soon as the government, you know regulations allowed us to but even then it was at a 25 percent limit rate so um, we benefited from the extraordinary um, 
donations of individuals, but also a lot of the government funding. Um, we were able to get two PPP loans, uh, SVOG loan, the Shuttered Venues Grant, which is because we have a theater with fixed seating. Oh, um, yeah. And those, along with um, another three or four different specific COVID grants, um, we got one from the town of Hempstead, we got support from Nassau County, um, as well as the federal government, really essential in helping us get through. Um, so we we opened and we grew at back as we could. This last spring, we had a dinosaur exhibit, our first, um, you know, Ooh. sort of, you know, uh, special, uh, special traveling exhibit that came in. And we really saw the return to visitors and guests that we had, you know, had been seeing pre-COVID. Um, it's, it's been a struggle, but I think it shows the commitment of the leadership of the museum, of our families, and the need for a place where people can come and explore and learn that is off the screen. You know, it's a, sort of what we offer, particularly now after COVID, for children who who lost so much in their learning and that time. And, you know, 2D learning on a screen can only do so much. Um, you know, shout out to the teachers who had to teach in that environment. I, yes. you know, we have so much respect for them and um, working with them and one of our partnerships. Um, we have a Westbury STEM program was extraordinary. Um, but now, you know, the off-screen learning, the hands-on, actually doing things, playing at our water play in our backyard or building blocks um, is even more essential to help recover some of that lost learning and put kids, um, you know, continue kids on their path towards, you know, their growth and, you know, sparking their imagination to what, what they might be in the future. Yeah, that experience of going through the museum and having that interactivity, there's really nothing that can replace that. And it's so needed. It's so necessary. What are the, some of the things that are on the horizon that you're really looking forward to the, with the museum? Yeah, I would say um, certainly the sock skating, winter village, holiday um, feeling. I just think what we're trying to provide is that experience for a family in the holidays to, you know, do something beautiful together. Definitely the Mo Willems exhibit in the spring. That's such a popular, he's such a popular author and um, really fun to to work and play around with his themes and stories. Um, I personally am excited for Cupcakes and Cocktails. Uh, we did it in person last year. It was a little bit smaller and I feel like this year we'll be back to full, you know, in museum play fun for adults. Um, and, and I've got to say the Saltwater Stories exhibit, um, feeling like the momentum of something new coming that really tells the story of Long Island for young children and families, this whole maritime culture that is deeply embedded in who we are is really, I mean, that's exciting to think about. It's still a little ways off. So um, my job is to, to raise the money to help fabricate that. But um, I just think it's it embodies what the museum, you know, when it was founded tw 25 years ago in a little, you know, uh, storefront on Stewart Avenue um, that's grown into what it is now today um, to engage families in interactive play, spark imagination, and tell the stories that are relevant to us. And how can we find information about the Long Island Children's Museum and how to visit and what's going on there? The best place is our website. That's licm.org. We'd like to thank our guest, Erica Floresca. She's the Director of Development at the Long Island Children's Museum. And always remember, the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by play instinct. Carl Jung. Thank you so much for having me. We want to thank you for being with us. My name is Ray Schwetz, along with Denise from Boston Hill, your co-hosts and producers. This is an NCC Foundation production. Visit nccradio.org for more information. We're available on Odyssey, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and as a podcast on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This has been Tower Talk Business Radio, powered by the NASA Community College Foundation, on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC.